We are in the middle of Eastertide, and the scriptures, the gospel lessons, are all pointing to the resurrected Jesus and these interactions that Jesus has with his followers, of reminding them uh, that he lives. So we have today the wonderful story from Luke's gospel of the walk to Emmaus. Luke 24, beginning in verse 13. Listen for God's word. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near them and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad, And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered Jesus, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, He took bread and blessed and broke it, and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen, he has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened to them on the road, and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, as you broke the bread before the two disciples, so break open our own hearts and our own understanding of how you restore us to living, how you give us hope. Speak to us through your word. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Reverend Cliff McKay is a friend, a clergy friend of Park Lake Church and a resident of Westminster Winter Park Towers. And he told this story in a recent creative writing magazine that was published by the Tower residents that Judy Cook gave me a copy of. Cliff writes this story. Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia was integrated in 1955. Calvin Houston and Larry Haygood were the first two black students in a predominantly white student body. Both were intelligent, thoughtful, and gracious, as you might expect theological students to be who were preparing for the ministry. 
The white students were accepting, and despite the anticipated fear of exclusion and hostility, the transition of the new students was seamless. Within a couple of months, says Cliff, four of us, including Calvin, were working on a class project that sent us out into the community. Our task took longer than expected, and when we checked our watches, we realized the seminary dining room had closed. No problem, we said to ourselves. We'll just stop by the Howard Johnson's on our way back. We were at the doorway of the restaurant ready to enter when we realized that our integrated group could not eat there. In a few brief weeks, despite what we had been taught all our lives, we had forgotten all the training that we had been raised with. We had forgotten the rules. We were integrated. Calvin was one of us, and we were one of him. Sheepishly, says Cliff, we asked Calvin, when did you realize we had a problem? Calvin answered, are you kidding? I knew the moment we remembered the refectory was closed. I was just curious how long it would take you guys to realize it. They had hoped that they had moved past any barriers of racism. They had hoped they would all be seen and treated equally if they acted equally. We put our heads together to consider about where we could eat. Calvin was noticeably quiet, enjoying our struggle with a, promen with a problem that had dominated his entire life. We could not come up with anything and were resigned to missing our meal and waiting for supper. When Calvin took pity on us and said, come on, I know a place where we can go. And we followed Calvin to a small cafe, mainly frequented by African-American diners. The owner looked frightened as our group of three young white men and a black man entered. Calvin reassured them. It's okay, he said, they're with me. I heard our morning's lesson as this story played out. Friends on a journey, expectations, hopes, dashed, a moment of recognition and invitation to a different table. Our scripture today is lovingly known as the road to Emmaus. A road is a place of travel, but it's also a place of in-between, of liminal space, a favorite concept of mine, a place of transition between here and there, sometimes between there and we don't know where. Jesus spent a lot of time on the road in those three years with his disciples. He was teaching them. He was healing. He was modeling leadership. He was explaining the nature of God. This time on the road, the disciples are traveling alone. Jesus has been in the grave for three days. There were rumors that were circulating of Jesus' sightings. But the rumors were really too otherworldly to possibly be true. Cleopas and his companion are going home because they don't really know what else to do. But soon, keeping pace with them is this stranger. It, it was likely a common practice in Palestine. Strangers heading in the same direction group up to lighten the load, to make the road shorter for safety reasons, to make the time pass quickly. Re-readers know that this stranger is Jesus, but the two disciples are kept from seeing Luke says, God uses this to delay a teaching moment, hardness of heart, of hearing, of seeing. In spite of this being a stranger, there's easy banter between them. The disciples are eager to have a fresh audience for their story of the past week. And they shared their dream as well their dream that 
we had hoped that he was the one who would restore Israel. Luke says they were sad as they walked, and we can just imagine their posture. One of the Sunday school classes was looking at this text this morning, and I believed used uh, Debbie Thomas's uh, Journeys with Jesus as one of the resources to talk about this, and I loved um, Debbie and the way that she describes where she says that Emmaus itself is a painfully familiar road for each of us. We've walked it, we've lost our way on it, we've left it behind and we've returned to it, but we had hoped. We had hoped that the tumor wasn't malignant. We had hoped that we would have learned from the last tragedy. We had hoped that our relationship would get better. We had hoped that our child would come home. We had hoped that our depression would lift. We had hoped to keep our jobs. We had hoped the pandemic would spare our family. We had hoped for a cure. We had hoped to experience God's presence. We had hoped our faith would survive. We had hoped. There are tears in that statement a lump in our throat. The disciples' words express the pain of disappointment and confusion and longing. Their words, they are words that we say when we are defeated, when our expectations have been dashed and our cherished dreams are dead and there's nothing left to do but leave diminished and done. But we had hoped on the Emmaus Road, two, the two disciples spilled out all their bottled up feelings to the stranger, the disappointment, the confusion, the embarrassment wrapped into that single, simple sentence. And Jesus let them talk. He listened as they spilled everything that they had. And then he adds to it. Their road journey extends to the home where Jesus characteristically takes on the role of host. He tells the disciples more than they had dared to hope, bringing out a depth and richment, richness to the story unlike they had ever known existed. The genius of Jesus bringing faith back to life simply by telling the stories, prodding the embers until they remember who they are and who they follow. And their hearts begin to warm. 15th century Indian mystic Kabir once wrote this. I felt the need for a great pilgrimage, so I sat still for three days, and God came to me. Our hopes might just be the beginning of something bigger that God is stirring inside of us. What do we hope? Where have we lost hope? What are we offering up as our disappointment could we be offering our disappointments and sadnesses as the beginning of prayer, inviting God into this conversation, into these hopes? What are the cries of our hearts? How can we hold that hope and God stirring in our hands and listen that God might be saying there is more? Dare we walk with Jesus? We've got some really big issues happening with us collectively on which there are many, many opinions. A lot of arguing, talking past one another, holding our ground, plugging our ears and our hearts. How will we ever get past this? How will we ever get past our, our racism our struggle with inclusion? 
How will we get past this gun violence that is taking over our communities and making us fearful, making us move our children? How will we address the depression and the mental health of our youngest, of our school-aged children? We had hoped that we would be more community. We had hoped that there would not be so much that would divide us. We had hoped that to be more welcoming of one another as God welcomes us. We had hoped to provide a safe world for our families. We had hoped for our children to grow in joy and in confidence. These are good hopes. In the book of Hopes of Survival Guide for Trying Times, Jane Goodall, who is the famous primatologist and champion of the Earth's tender wildness, She says this, hope is often misunderstood. People tend to think that it is simply passive wishful thinking. I hope something will happen, but I'm not going to do anything about it. This is indeed, she says, the opposite of real hope, which requires action and engagement. We hope and we engage that hope. The author of 1 Peter that Dan read this morning reminds us that your faith and your hope are set on God. Hope, like fire, like flowers, requires tending. It is not static to be acquired and admired, but a living characteristic that we can't let die or let loose that we can let die or let loose. After all, Jesus was not contempt contempt to keep resurrection, that greatest expression of hope to himself. Jesus set out on a mission to resurrect his disciples' hearts and then commissioned them to spread the resurrection to the rest of the world. Hope thrives when it is kindled by the spirit of Christ and it is lived lived out in faith. We had hoped. This is truly the beginning of a way of calling upon the presence of Christ to be part of our lives and to invite Christ to walk with us and to Teach us how to hope and to show us the way.